and Mike will get started. Thank you, Maria. And thank you everyone, especially folks who travel great distances to be here. It's really an honor to have you here. Um, I want to start off, and some of you have heard me uh, give this little spiel before, it is one of my favorites, but um, I was, at one point I was a little bit confused by Dr. Wieda's uh, um, assessment that, uh, or what I interpreted as regulation being part or a cause of the uh, loss of the small family farm. And I think we cleared it up, but I, uh, um, I want to start off with my story of what I think have happened to the family farms uh, versus this uh, corporate industry model that we have now. And it starts with a diary that I found uh, from a farmer from 1918. And in that diary, he explains or he uh, writes down what he's getting paid for the different items. And in there, he gets paid uh, 25 cents for a dozen eggs. And a dozen eggs today, buck 50. Okay, so it went up six times in the last 90 years. Um, a dozen ears of corn was 45 cents. A dozen ears of corn now? Three bucks, 250, something like that. So that went up six times, uh, seven times. Pound of butter was 45 cents. Now pound of butter, two, three dollars. Went up six to eight times. So all these products, and you don't, see this is, I'm a very simplistic, uh, and possibly naive economy person, but um, I just compare, instead of trying to figure out everything about gross products and stuff like that, I just compare apples in 1918 to apples in 2010. And I, play, and I compare movie ticket prices in 1918 to movie ticket prices in 2010, and sneaker prices and gas prices, and that's how I do it. So how much was a movie in 1918? Five cents, Nickelodeon. Right? That's where the term Nickelodeon comes from. You could go all day and watch them for a nickel. And now the last time I just went, it was $12. And the movie was awful. <laughs> so I paid, like, what is that, 200 times? Wait, 20 times just to get up to 10? That's over 200 times. So the price of a food product went up six times in the last 92 years, while the price of a movie went up over 200 times. A, ga a gallon of gas was two cents which is a very important one since petroleum is the basis now of our farming industry. That's the expense. So the expense for their petroleum output has gone up by 200 times while the value, their intake, is only going up six times. Well, if you can't figure out there's a problem there, you know, sneakers, you name it, any of our thing, cars, the car was 500 bucks. Now a cheap one's 20,000. That one even went up 40 times. So I think it is one of the most embarrassing and disrespectful things within this country that we still claim, or at least the government and our commodities brokers, still claim that we need to keep cheap food. It's ridiculous. Now, I, and I will, some people say, well, what about all the poor people? You are starving out. And I just ask you to come to my house, and I live downtown York, plenty of people that are below the 20,000 level, and you look at the crap in their garbage that they're throwing out, the plastic stupid stuff from Walmart, all this junk, and then you can't come and complain to me about having to pay a little bit extra for food. Um, and a small solution that I can promote before I get into to the science and stuff I brought for you today is that I go to Central Market, I go to my buddy David Dietz and his father, and uh, when they tell me my bill is $12, I give them $15. When they bill, tell me my bill is $2.10, I give them the $3, whatever I can. You give them extra. And it's not even about the money, but it's a statement of respect. You know, the, the idea that they're only, the idea that you would work the land and be the steward and then almost have to beg to even make a profit. It, it is, it's just insane. So I would ask you all to go to your local farmers and thank them and, um, and give them more than they ask. You're welcome. 
Now, I've got about 60 slides on here, so I'm going to buzz through like crazy. All right, we got like 150 members. There's 500 stewards around. Uh, the stewards, it doesn't cost you anything to be a steward. All you have to do is jump on our email list, and whenever you see something funky, give us a call. That makes you a steward of the Lower Susquehanna. Love to have you all. We have a little sign-up sheet right over there if you're interested. Uh, we cover 24 counties in Pennsylvania and four in Maryland. So if it ever, if I ever uh, miss your call or anything, imagine that we're trying to cover over 9,000 square miles and figure out land uses and everything going on. It is kind of nuts, but it is what we do. Uh oh, why is this not moving forward? There we go. Don't just work on farms, we work on a lot of things. We work on the hydroelectric dams that threaten to destroy the entire Chesapeake Bay. Um, and uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, when we beat Bruner Island, or when we talked them into uh, putting in over $200 million in uh, improvements, because we had them on 1,500 violations, and they said, okay, we'll just do the improvements. When they got penalties of $183,000, they were going to give those penalties to what I call the, the uh, abyss, which is, the, is Harrisburg. Um, so we said, no, don't give that money to Harrisburg. We want it to go to the York County Conservation District and the Lancaster County Conservation District for improvements for farms. And we did. We got $91,000 going straight to our conservation district here in New York and another 90000 going over to Lancaster. Uh, but we do have farm issues. This is Crider. Now Crider is looking for ways to try and improve, but this is the biggest CAFO we got around here. Um, I can't even tell you how many thousands of dairy and uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, actually millions of chickens in this small area. The important thing about this picture are these ponds here in the middle. 50% of Lancaster County, which has most of the CAFOs in Pennsylvania, is on limestone geology. The stuff goes straight down through the ground. So all these BMPs, best management practices, buffers, all these kinds of things do very little when you're applying too much manure directly to an area that's known as karst geology or limestone. Here in York, we've only got 10%. Um, now, the uh, problem here is that limestone soil is some of the best soil around. Mm -hmm. So we got the best place to farm is on the worst place to over apply the nutrients. Uh, and what we find here is that when we go to Lidditz Spring, which is the place where the groundwater drains to, when this beautiful, uh, it looks a little dark on there, but it's actually a beautiful old uh, German uh, construction that uh, when the water comes out of there, it's already 50% above the human health standard for nitrogen. Oh. Lidditz Run is one of the most restored, if not the most restored, stream in Pennsylvania. And they've got great trout in there. They've done a great job on the habitat. But it's not helping the river and helping the Chesapeake Bay when it's bubbling out at 15 uh, parts per million nitrogen, or 50% above the human health standard. And that's what it looks like when you do the actual test and you hold it up to the light. The darker it is, and that one's off the charts. Uh, we also have other facilities that aren't CAFOs that spread in the winter time, which is illegal in Maryland, but um, I've been assured by the Secretary of Agriculture himself uh, when I spoke with him last month that uh, we would not be changing the rules regarding uh, winter manure application. So we are not only over applying manure, but we're allowing it to be applied on frozen ground. This was actually applied um, the day after Christmas last year. Does anybody remember Christmas last year and the day after? We had like 12 to 16 inches of snow on Christmas, and the next day it was almost all gone. Well, in this case, they went out and applied manure right on top of that snow. I couldn't get the DEP out at the time, and by the time they got there, the uh, farmer called me a liar and said that uh, the, the manure had been under the snow. But this is all just the manure just pouring in here. The river's so bad that the, um, you may have seen the article in last night or the night before's uh, York Dispatch intersects fish in the Susquehanna River. That means they're, the males are getting female characteristics and the females are getting male characteristics. It means that the, almost 100% of the smallmouth bass, our second most important sport fish, 
um, almost 100% of those bass have eggs forming in their testes. So the Fish and Boats Commission said that the quality of the Susquehanna River has become impaired to the level that it is seriously impacting its nationally reputed smallmouth bass fishery. These are some of the lesions. Can you see these things? This is not normal. These fish coming out, these things. tails are eaten away, their eyes are all foggy, their mouths are all messed up. And some of these, the last one, Alguit Creek, is actually one of our cleaner creeks. Mm. Not only that, but the young of year recruitment. So we actually are getting, even with the eggs in their testes, the male fish can still spawn. But look at the number of young of year. Why, why is the young of year? Since 2002, we haven't had any decent recruitment. They're dying off, even if they are born, they're dying off by August because of dead zones similar to uh, what you probably heard about down in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, here the rates are even lower. We're seeing like one fish for every 50 meters. Okay, what's going on? This thing is cramping my style. All right, the, this is what regular normal young of year look like. They look like little healthy miniatures. Maybe I should use the arrows, huh? No, because I want to fly through this. Um, here's what they look like in the Susquehanna. There, uh, there's all sorts of infections on the fish. They've lost their tails. So they're not even getting a chance to get a start. They're, they're getting wiped out at the very beginning. Here we go. These little arrows work better. Intersex is sexual organ mutation. Chemicals in the water are acting like estrogen, causing the male smallmouth to form immature eggs. Lesions and gill deformations are seen along with this condition. But it's not just that. There are over 400 endocrine disruptors. That endocrine disruptors is the chemical name, like the uh, um, the uh, rod. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I wasn't looking for examples. I was trying to think of what did the chiropractor just discuss? Our nervous system. Nervous system. Nervous system. You also have an endocrine system, which is all the glands that are in your body, including your sex organs. Um, and we know that these 400 chemicals are affecting animals and humans, um, but they're not made illegal yet. And of course, tens of thousands of these chemicals have not even been tested yet. The EPA tells us that there are 84,000 chemicals that are just out here and being used. And when it comes to, for instance, the wastewater flow, they test for 11 out of 84,000. So, um, and every sample of water has been found to have these endocrine disruptors in it, whether well water, doesn't matter where you are. Here's an interesting thing that I uh, actually premiered at the last event down uh, um, uh, in Maryland, was uh, it's not only about what the chemicals are, because when, when they test fish for us, they test the meat, right? We don't care what's in their brain or anything like that. And they test the meat and they say, oh look, the muscle, it doesn't have any chemicals in it. These fish must be fine. But when you actually test where the chemicals are going, the females, the chemicals go straight into the gonads. They go straight into the ovaries, affecting the egg production. And the males, uh, it will be no surprise that most of the chemicals go to the males' brains, <laughs> um, and somewhat to their spleen. 